particular session, I would like to invite speaker, Dr. Abhijit Taravdar. He needs no introduction. As we all know, he's a very senior, renowned nephrologist and a renowned kidney transplant specialist. And I also welcome chairpersons for this particular session, nephrologist Dr. Vismay Kumar and Dr. Toshiroti Shorkar, who is ex-HOD SSK and he's a consultant physician, and Dr. Bhutate Mukherjee, who is a cardiodiabetic physician. I welcome all the chairpersons and speakers here on stage. And this particular session of selection of anti-diabetic agents in CKD has been sponsored by Lupin. If we kindly have the slide for Lupin, please. Bestogen is manufactured in a WHO GAP certified world-class manufacturing site. It is shipped from manufacturing site via air cargo. Bestogen is received in India in highest cold chain standard. It is certified by National Institute of Biologicals for quality post quality check. Passogen is transported to warehouse via cold van. Passogen is maintained in temperature of 2. Now this time we are meeting for the morning which is past Past Dr. Shubham Kochoki. We still going to start in cold van. We are not only knowledge person. And next Dr. Kullan Mokovar time. And now Nonetheless, Dr. Oviji Taruda, who remained always silent, speechless, but with profound knowledge. May I have the opportunity to request Dr. Oviji Taruda to deliver his discussion, but this time no slide will be shown. Excuse me for that. We'll speak only. May I request? Dr. Oviji Tarudar to start his derivation, please. Respected chairpersons, honorable guests. And the audience. Good morning, welcome. When I was requested to share some of our experiences in managing diabetes with oral anti-diabetic, I'm not speaking on the other agents, oral anti-diabetic agents in chronic kidney disease, I, I was elated because I thought that it is high time that I can share some of my experiences with diabetologists of other part of the Ganges, other side of the Ganges. But to my utter surprise, I find that majority of the diabetologists thought that it is prudent not to attend this session. So it is a shock to me that I could come sparing all my preoccupations to attend this session. But here, most of the diabetologists of Howrah, they preferred to bunk this session. So when we take classes of our students, we, we sometimes rebuke them. Fortunately, uh, in, in my classes, students come from uh, other parts of the city, other parts of the country also. But here, it is an exception. I find the senior diabetologists also thought that it is prudent not to attend this session. Intentionally, I have not brought any slides. Because if slides are being presented, they say bar. The, the, the communication between the speaker and the audience gets hindered. That lady, she is trying hard to mobilize persons from outside, but all in vain. 
I, I, I have told about you, that you, you are trying, but I think it's all in vain. People are not that mobilized to come inside. There are more, I mean, better attractions outside. Whatever. So coming to the specific topic that I, I, I would embark upon, how a patient who has chronic kidney disease should be managed when an anti-diabetic, oral anti-diabetic is being prescribed. While I deliver, I have two requests. Firstly, keep your mobile phones in silence mode because if I find that somebody has some very important things to discuss, I'll wait. The discussion will be over like the person who was taking the photographs. I'll wait. Let his job be over and then I'll restart because I have no slides. I have no problem. And the second part is, while I deliver, whenever there is any confusion, anything that, any doubt or anything you, you think, you stop me. I'll stop, I'll explain, and then once again, I'll get back to my presentation. It's not like a, a it's not like a one-way sort of presentation. It's, 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 there are two ways, it's called didactic method. It's not a didactic method, it's a Socratic method that I, I would refer to, uh, resort to. So the first thing is, a patient who has diabetic kidney disease and has a normal renal function, by normal I mean when the GFR is more than 60, what is the preferred anti-diabetic? While you think it over, I would share with you that when a patient develops chronic kidney disease, There are some modifications, changes in the internal milieu in a chronic kidney disease individual. As for example, in advanced chronic kidney disease, the patient is azotemic, there are azotemic symptoms, so he or she eats less. Second, chronic kidney disease itself, the uremic environment makes the gut less motile, so the gut motility is less. Third, there are a lot of things that are being orally ingested, rather medications also. Those may prevent absorption of those anti-diabetic agents. As for example, oral phosphate binders, liquid antacids, many people, even PPIs. In, in the Bengali community, they inherently suffer from PPI deficiency. So they continue to take PPIs. So PPIs may affect also. After that drug is being ingested, leave aside this drug-drug interaction, the drug has to bind with Kothanaikin. The drug has to bind with some carrier protein. In CKD, there is protein deficiency, so this binding to that protein also gets hindered. Sometimes some other agents, they may affect this binding also. The drug reaches the kidney. As GFR is low, excretion is less. It is excreted inside the tubule, then the action, the other interaction between the tubule tubular cells and the drug also changes. There may be, in the, the interaction may be tubular secretion, tubular metabolism, absorption, all these are affected. So there are lot many places where an anti-diabetic, when it is being orally taken, is ingested, it may affect the function of that particular anti-diabetic agent. Yes, when the GFR was 60, what anti-diabetic? The answer is any damn antibiotic, an anti-diabetic, whichever anti-diabetic you, anti-diabetic you prefer to take, there is no objection from our side, you can take it. Now the GFR falls below 60, the situation changes, so you have to pick and choose some of the anti-diabetic agents depending on the GFR, depending on the environment. 
The most commonly used oral antidiabetic is sulfonylureas. Of the sulfonylureas, the first generation sulfonylureas, they tend to cause hypoglycemia because they tend to accumulate. So we prefer to choose glyglazide and glebezide of the sulfonylurea group which can be jolly well given in a patient who has a compromised GFR. Please remember, many patients get glimepiride. <coughs> glimepiride To finish off, then, then I'll, I'll start. No, no, I, I'll wait. Your deliberation is over, then I'll restart. To finish off, I'm here. I'm waiting for your deliberation to complete. So, regarding glimepiride, glimepiride is metabolized to two substances. One is inactive, inactive in the sense that is not being excreted through the kidneys in an active form. But another agent is an active metabolite which is excreted through the kidneys. So, when you are giving glimepiride and if GFR is compromised, there is every chance for that metabolite to accumulate causing hypoglycemia. And there is a recent paper which has shown that in Indian subcontinent, the commonest agent which causes hypoglycemia with hypoglycemic admissions in year is glimepiride, not even insulin. In patients who have compromised GFR, CKD patients. In CKD patients, hypoglycemia, the commonest agent is glimepiride. So while using glimepiride in a patient who has compromised GFR, please think twice. Yes, madam, you, you finish off, then I'll restart. You finish off, then I'll restart. Okay. So this is about sulfonyl ureas. Next agent is metformin. Metformin is a magic drug. Metformin is the only drug known as of now which has some benefit on longevity. You know better than me that it has some longevity benefit also. Metformin is a very good drug, it is safe, it is cheap, well tolerated in majority of patients, but when the GFR falls less than 45 or 50, it is better to reduce the dose of metformin because of the theoretical quote-unquote complication of lactic acidosis. So the dose has to be reduced to 1000 milligram and when the GFR falls below 30, this is the recommendation. It is better to withdraw. But there is a huge amount of literature which has shown that metformin can be given even at a GFR less than 30. The only thing is that in those patients who have acute kidney injury and an unstable GFR, suppose today the GFR is 20, tomorrow is 30, the next day is 10, like this unstable GFR, it is better to avoid metformin in a patient who has chronic kidney disease. This is regarding metformin. Glenoids, repaglenide, nephrologists do use, though there are anecdotal experiences of hypoglycemia, it's good drug, well tolerated, it has to be given relatively I mean, at a relatively uh, lesser uh, distance from the meals, the prandial pricks of glycemia can be well tolerated by glenoids. Finished? Next comes the next agent that, yes please? Anything? No, I mean, I, 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 I say that at any time you stop me, discuss, then we'll proceed to the next topic. Next comes the other agents like glitazones. Now, the glitazones, bioglitazone, the good thing about bioglitazone is it 
can be given even at a relatively low GFR. The bad side is pyoglitazone tends to cause fluid retention. And with advancing renal failure, when the patient has already edema and it aggravates edema, it may aggravate heart. Pyoglitazone? Pyoglitazone you can be given it. It will end stage renal disease. There is no, no GFR cutoff. No GFR cutoff. Pyoglitazone can be given. The only thing is that it tends to cause fluid accumulation and heart failure gets aggravated. Next are the glyptines. Hmm, please, please. No, no, not, it is not affected now. I am saying with, with compromised GFR, the pyogritazone dose modification is not required because it does not accumulate. It causes fluid retention. Mechanism is different. Because of fluid retention, there is chances of heart failure, aggravation of heart failure. But Hypoglycemia is not a problem because hypoglycemia is not, because it, it doesn't accumulate. It doesn't accumulate. Okay. Yes, yes, there are reports, but there, there are a lot of theories. It says that at, as it causes volume retention, there is the hemodilution, and that is reflected as anemia. It is not the pyogritazone itself causing anemia. That is one of the reasons, the explanations. Yes, please. Yes. Yes, that's true. Yes. There is no study as of now, but you are right that it may aggravate the renal bone disease caused by chronic kidney disease. Actually speaking, pyogritazone is not something that is our. Uh, we, we, we find it very comfortable with in, in advanced chronic kidney disease. I am just theoretically, pyogritazone is an option. That I am saying. Coming to glyptins, because if because this program is being sponsored by uh, those companies which are uh, propagating glyptin, if I don't say anything about glyptin, then they will not allow us to have our lunch. <laughs> so coming to the glyptins, there are a lot of glyptins, of which most of the glyptins, the majority of glyptins, they require dose modification. I am not talking about the heart failure advantage and all. From nephrology perspective, dose adjustment is of paramount importance. Why I will say just now. Most of the glyptins, their dose has to be reduced when the GFR is less than 50. And when the GFR falls below 25, the dose has to be made. 140. It's simple. There are other calculations also 30, 49, 45. But for students, the best thing is 50, reduce it by 50, 25, reduce it by 25. Except linagliptin. Linagliptin, we nephrologists prefer linagliptin for several reasons. One is this there's no dose adjustment. Second, there is a theoretical advantage that it reduces renal fibrosis. It is saying that DPP-4 accumulation is highest in the kid kidneys and that is the reason why they reduce renal fibrosis. I am not talking about those theoretical aspects. What I say is linagliptin possibly reduces proteinuria, but whether it is translated into protection in terms of GFR preservation, that is a debatable issue. The more important part of linagliptin is, linagliptin is an agent which can be administered, can be prescribed in a patient who has chronic kidney disease with normal GFR, chronic kidney disease with compromised GFR, chronic kidney disease at the stage of end-stage renal disease not on dialysis, end-stage renal disease on dialysis, and end-stage renal disease after transplant. That is the reason we, we prefer linagliptin to such an extent. Because suppose you have started, in, in, in your experience you must agree with me, you have started some antihypertensive blood pressure medicine. And if you say six months down the line you change this to that, and again after six months you change to that, either the patient will shift to some other doctor or he will continue to receive the same antihypertensive which he is comfortable with. 
So it is always better to stick to one anti-diabetic, which you can start and which you can end with. You start with Lina and you end with Lina. That's the reason we nephrologists prefer Lina. Compared to the other anti-diabetics, Lina has this advantage that you can start with Lina and you can end with Lina. Even those persons who do not have diabetes and develop post-transplant diabetes mellitus, so called PTDM or NODAT, in them also there are ample evidence that you can start Lina. I mean you can give Lina, you can give metformin also, you can give insulin also, but you can give Lina as well. So Lina is something which you can keep, a nephrologist can keep in his gym at any time, any diabetic patient and who has chronic kidney disease, oh, okay, Lina there, no problem, Lina. Lina is such a safe drug. Hypoglycemia is there. There are evidences reported hypoglycemia. They are few and far between, extremely rare. That's the reason we nephrologists are so fond of Lina Gliptin. Then, after Gliptin, I have left any, any other group? No, it is not Sita Gliptin will damage his kidney. The thing is that when you have to reduce the dose. When the GFR calculated, now eGFR you can calculate from your mobile phone also. Suppose the GFR falls less than 50, because 1.8 creatinine in a patient who is 75, the body weight is 40, you will find the GFR is pretty low. So you have to reduce the dose of Sita Gliptin. And if the, it falls below 25, you have to further reduce to 25 percent. But Lina? You want to ask? Yes, please. Uh, this is the drug which has the best benefit as well. Of the gliptin? No, the thing is that of all the gliptins, they have, it has been found, they do not have a renal benefit in terms of GFR preservation. Whatever trial, whatever benefit is being accrued, that is in terms of proteinuria reduction. When we were students, it was said that Proteinuria is synonymous with renal good or bad, kidney good, no proteinuria, kidney. But now there is a dissociation. It has been found that even with proteinuria, a person may live long, and even with without proteinuria because of interstitial injury, because in kidney the emphasis is on interstitial injury. In interstitial injury, you may not have proteinuria, but still. Still, you may have kidney injury. Yes, I'm not talking about the cardiovascular, I'm only about the renal. Cardiovascular, yes. There are so many studies, SAXA, CETA, and all the there's so many. I'm, I'm not going into those cardiovascular benefits. I'm only speaking on the renal benefits and whether I should continue with that or not. You, you complete. The, I, I'm waiting for your uh, mobile, I mean, the, the phone call to complete. Finished? Okay, the, that's good. So, Yes, please. Is there any preference over tenalegliptin? Tenalegliptin, the problem is there is no hard data. But the problem, tenalegliptin came with a ban. The biggest advantage was price benefit. But the disadvantage? Let him complete his phone call. Completed? Yeah. Okay. But the problem is there are reports of prolonged QT and arrhythmias with the other complications, the limitations I am not talking about. Data is lacking and this prolonged QT and cardiac arrhythmias, that is something that is a hindrance towards generally. But once again I tell you, regarding renal protection, GFR and all, tenalegliptin data is not uh, robust. It's no... Uh, another question, you mentioned that uh, we can start with Lina and end with Lina, but in case if, uh, if my personal experience is the lina is a lesser uh, high, uh, causes less amount of decrease in sugar levels that's rather true. than other cetagliptin uh, or other that's true. Yes, that's true. So prefer in that case, when <coughs> patient is at a uh, more uh, is not readily compromised, then probably other gliptins would be better. No, no, I told you because other the problem lies it is that not uh, because of uh, suppose the patient as the GFR drops. The problem is not glycemic control. The problem is, 
I, I think I, I would go into because he's my student, so I can discuss some uh, a, a, a little bit in more in depth. Few trials like Accord and other trials they have shown that when the hemoglobin A1C is 8.5 and above, then renal protection is bad. So a patient whose GFR is normal, then your target will be to keep the hemoglobin A1C less than 8.5 for renal protection. Then the more important thing is renal protection. But when the GFR is compromised, then it has been found there is a linear relationship between low hemoglobin A1C, particularly if the hemoglobin A1C is less than 5.6, 5.35 and below with mortality. So initially, when we manage antidiabetics, our purpose is renal protection. And then we target towards strict glycemic control. And with advancing renal failure, our purpose is not renal protection. Our purpose is to preserve longevity or to prevent mortality. And when that is the issue, then we have to prevent hypoglycemia. As you have said, I completely agree with you that in a patient in the early diabetic kidney disease, early DKD, it is more important, more prudent to target hemoglobin A1C to keep it less than 7.5, maybe 7 or something. But when a patient has started developing renal failure, it is better to make it relatively loose. So it is better to allow the patient not to fall the hemoglobin A1C less than 6.5. It is better to keep it 7 and above. So that is the thing. So as you have said, it is right that in early stage, Saksa or any, anything, Sita, you, you start with that. But with advancing renal failure, now we are in advanced CKD. In advanced CKD, I would not prefer to give those because invariably the patient will fail to reduce the dosage and there is every chance of hypoglycemia, even hypoglycemic death, admissions or death. So I'm more concerned about that. Renal, renal, renal protection is not that important. Understand? <coughs> yes, please. You see, I mean, in, in all descriptions, it is said that these are the exceptions. And, and when we, we teach our students, we say, you read the text, not the exceptions. I have one student, he's a very good student, but he always started from the exceptions. And in the DNB, I, actually, the year before, he, uh, uh, he knows one of my uh, DNB students, he got the gold medal securing the first position in, of, of all the DNB students in the country. So all uh, candidates who appeared in the DNB examination, he was first. But this candidate, he always came prepared with all the footnotes. If you go with the footnotes, then you'll miss the texts. My grandmother, father's mother, <coughs> she was not a diabetic, but she was hypertensive. She was 112 kg weight and her blood pressure was 230 by 140. Since the time I started checking blood pressure, I found 230 by 140. She used to stay alone in, in, a, in a place, uh, it's almost semi-urban place. She used to go to see movies. She, she was not seeing properly, but she used to catch someone. He used to accompany him to the cinema hall and she used to come back like that. And she died at the age of 92. She is an exception. So then, with this exception, will you not treat any patient of 240 by 130? Yes or no? Yes. <coughs> now, coming next to gliptin, anything is left? I'm, now I'm coming to this SGLT2 inhibitor. SGLT2 inhibitor is, is, a, is an area of big debate. You, you'll tell me, when, when I, I exceed the time, I'll stop. 
the moment you 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 tell me that i'll stop i'll stop okay. five more minutes or, or or i'll stop here sgl to inhibitor we can discuss on five minutes so sgl to inhibitor is something that is preferred by uh, non nephrologists but not preferred to that extent by nephrologists the question is why that there are at least two more nephrologists sitting over there the, this this question can be addressed from different angles as for example let us start from the mechanism of sgl2 inhibitor sgl2 inhibitor i am not going into the depth of the uh, details of mechanism it is said that they cause constriction of afferent arteriole okay but afferent arteriole constriction is done by other agents even much better than sgl2 inhibitor like prostaglandin inhibitors prostaglandin inhibitors they also cause afferent arteriole constriction but if you give prostaglandin inhibitors like nsaids in combination with arbs because all these are being given with arbs our experience is there will be acute kidney injury acute renal failure no i am not no no i am not i am not going into the interstitial nephrology i am going to mechanistically if there is afferent arteriolar constriction and efferent arteriolar dilatation by this agents acis or arb invariably there is a fall in gfr and you get a reversible ati there is no proof that reducing this intraglobular pressure by afferent arteriolar constriction causes renal protection by these agents prostaglandin inhibitors then why what is the other advantage of this agent sglt2 inhibitors there are lot of theories theory after theory they cause normoglycemic or euglycemic ketosis that ketone body they cause so many i mean at least so many theories so when there are so many theories it means that you don't know the real answer so the mechanism is still not very clear how it is exactly doing some benefit it is said that there is sodium distal sodium delivery and that is being sensed by macula densa well if sodium delivery is good from the proximal side there are other proximal tubule diuretics also so this proximal tubule diuretics also cause sodium delivery then they came up and said no no it is not sodium alone sodium and chloride because chlorium uh, there, there is a controversy between uh, in, in our class also you uh, satak you remember it is whether it is chloride or sodium which is being sensed by macula densa so this you know it is chloride which is being sensed because the proximal tubule diuretics they in addition to sodium they also cause distal delivery of bicarbonate so it is not chloride then the answer came then then why not thiazide diuretics the answer was no thiazide diuretics they act distal to the site of macula densa then can why then why not uh, high ceiling diuretics they are proximal to the site of macula densa then say no this high ceiling diuretics they are short acting then the answer came there are long acting high ceiling diuretics also like tosamide why not tosamide and there is no answer so mechanistically we do not know exactly how it is working that is one second is in animal experiments the same model same model like those who have hyperfiltration injury like uh, this 56 uh, nephrectomy rash there these agents failed miserably miserably they did not result in any benefit in animal experiments in 56 nephrectomy rats not only that even in human experiments in non diabetic in non diabetic patient there is a study by rajasekhar where these acl2 inhibitors were tried in focal segmental sclerosis that's also a hyperfiltration injury model once again miserable result no benefit there are questions we need to just go by the evidence so that is work for the no no i i i have i have not going i i'm just started with the mechanism so this is one 
The next step is the trials. The trials. We go by the trials. If you go by the trials, you see the trial design. In trial design, in all the trials, starting from uh, Kana to Dapa to Impa, the comparison was between ARB or ACI plus SGLT2 inhibitor compared with ARB or ACI. That means A plus B is compared with A. A plus B is compared with A because SGLT2 inhibitors are basically proximal tubule diuretics to nephrologists. So if you compare, then you add some proximal tubule diuretic also with the placebo limb. You never. You never. No. Why, why not? You tell me. No, it is it is no it is not mentioned. It is not mentioned. No, I, I, I have I have gone through the details of that. It is not mentioned. No, it is not mentioned. It is not mentioned. No. Thirdly, thirdly, if if you have read it in depth, you will find suppose I am giving you the example of Kana. In Kana, in all these, do you think that the endpoints were blood pressure control? No. I don't know about the heart failure. No, no. I, no, I am talking about these uh, the, the, the trials where the blood pressure is not an end point. But if you see the placebo limb and the kana limb or the dapa limb, you will find the dapa limb or the kana limb is much superior in terms of blood pressure control. Much, much superior. As for example, in kana limb, there, the blood pressure is 3.2 millimeter mercury less than the placebo limb. So what do you expect? Suppose at the end of the study, if you find that the canal limb has a 3.2 millimeter mercury blood pressure less, do you expect that the result will be the same? In DAPA also, if you see the end result, and not before the end result, let us see, in DAPA also, when we start, we have found that almost 15% of patients had a GFR. GFR was less than 30. You look into the depth, you will find the placebo limb, the GFR, the compromised GFR was in higher proportion of patients. In 15.4% of patients, the GFR is less than 30, whereas in the, the limb of DAPA, it is 13.6%. Almost 2% of patients at the beginning they have a compromised GFR. And at the end also, if you see the blood pressure control, if you will find that uncontrolled blood pressure is there in the DAPA limb in 151 patients, whereas uncontrolled blood pressure is there in 216 patients in placebo. So you have allowed these patients to have an uncontrolled blood pressure till the end and then you say, well, this is inferior. But fee for interaction was not significant. Pardon? Fee for interaction. No, that is, that is no, I, this, this, we what? Talk about <laughs> no, no, I, I agree. No, no, these, 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 these are the criticism. No, no, I am, I am only, only conveying the criticisms of that trials. <clears throat> I'm not saying. I agree. No, no. What I say is these are the criticisms that are being placed forward against these studies. And the last but not, not the least is all these things, that are, all the studies, most of the studies, there are few things in common. Firstly, all these studies were started and the result was so overwhelming that they, dis they had to be discontinued at 2.4 years or 2.6 years. That is one. Second, all these studies are pharmaceutical company driven and not by some independent treating hospital guided studies. This is second. Third, 
of the authors, 11 to 12 authors, five or six authors are from those pharmaceutical companies. And most interesting thing is some of those authors, they are common in those studies. You will find this Hairspring or Wheeler, they are there in Canna as well as DAPA studies. Most of them are from uh, clinical pharmacology. Sir, can we wrap up yes, in a minute's yes. time? Just one yes. minute. Yes. 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 One minute. Thank you. So these are some of the reasons why nephrologists are not yet convinced. It's not said that we are not writing it. The thing is that many of our colleagues who are diabetologists, who are physicians, they are writing, they are getting benefit. And if we see the patient is getting benefit, you continue with that. The only question is, we are not yet in a position to make up our mind. If the patient gets benefit, we continue. If the patient doesn't, we discontinue. As simple as that. When we started with ACI earlier, we had the same logic. Those patients, many patients, they are on ACI or ARB, and we have continued for so many years with benefit. But there are patients who are on ACI or ARB, where we found there is progressive deterioration of renal function, and we have stopped it. So our logic, our take home message will be, it is not that well, as some pharmaceutical company driven trials have told us that well, this is the last word in managing chronic kidney disease, the diabetes in chronic kidney disease, these, these are not anti-diabetic agents. You have to continue to it. Our logic is, our request is, you please be guided by your own logic, your own decision, and if the patient gets benefit with an ACU to inhibitor, you continue with it. If you find that it is not benefited, and if you find there are pro I, I have seen so many patients where there is progressive rise of creatinine, progressive deterioration of renal function, we have to discontinue it. So it is not that we have made up our mind. It is not that we say that it is not working. So many trials and so many evidences, it is very difficult to go away from it. But logic is, Please let your judgment take a precedence over whatever is being taught by some pharmacy industry driven trials. And Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank a big hand to uh, Dr. Tarabda. Uh, he has so many learning points. Uh, Dr. Bansali, I'm sorry. We are running late already by an hour. Uh, I, I wish we perhaps had no, several no. hours no, that's what discussing I, I, this. I said that you, we, you go on asking questions will, while, while I'm presenting. Yeah, I'm so it, has, it has been a wonderful session, fine. a great interacting session. So we'll close it here and thank you once again. You. We would like to invite you again, this time for a longer session next time, because it truly is a, a, a different way of looking at basically learning together. I think that's a great way of... Thank you, very much. thank you thank you sir and uh, any questions you thank thank you sir and it was an excellent and excellent deliberation and it was a real honor for me for my society to sit and hear to you sir you are the dronacharya of nephrology if i say and being a nephrology sitting and hearing it was a pleasure and one of the best talks i've ever heard so i have uh, just two questions uh, specific to two groups of drug, where does uh, uh, alpha glycosidase inhibitor find its place in the changing GFR pattern? And secondly, metformin is one drug which has a cutoff for GFR, but when we use it, the GFR is very brittle. Suddenly it rises when you use, when you stop, it comes down, but sugars get excellently controlled. That's the question for metformin and Lena. Is there any dose? Because the prescriptions vary from 10 milligram and there's no 2.5 milligram available. So is there any dose uh, adjustment with linagliptin? Thank you. Coming to the first question, megalitol, no. It is better to avoid. The other acarbos and all, there is no data at a GFR of less than 3 or 2.5. So up to 3, you can comfortably give. I think it is better not to give when the GFR, I mean creatinine falls below 3, 2.5 or 3. Second is uh, metformin. I, I issue, raise that issue. When there is stable GFR, metformin is good. When there is unstable GFR, suppose the GFR varies in AKI situation, it is better not to go ahead with metformin. 
and lena the comfortable dose starting dose should be 5 and depending on the response you you can uh, hover between the other dosage but i think 5 is a comfortable dose next doctor of that thank you so much sir i would just take a moment and uh, request joyti di to kindly felicitate dr tarofdar on behalf of howrah diabetes study society we have a small token of appreciation from the blind school and it is none other than madurga tomorrow is mahalaya so we wish that madurga gives us more power and strength throughout the day and uh, this is to mention specifically that dr tarofdar being a renowned nephrologist and we do not need any introduction he is also also a renowned writer besides this and this adds to his glorious